have some weight in terms of why I might have at least some degree of credibility to talk about this topic. So very interestingly, I wore the uniform very early uh, when I was still in school. I went into RIMC, which means Rashi Indian Military College. It was actually Prince of Wales Royal Indian Military College. So the time when you didn't have NDA and you didn't have IMA, but it was the Britishers who were recruiting the princes to lead the Indian Army, they had a school for the Royals. It was called Royal Indian Military College. So when the Britishers were outside, Royal was simply changed into Russia and it became Russian and Military College. It's a feeder school into NDA and holds the Guinness Book of World Records for the highest number of gallantry award winners anywhere in the world. So very early as a young boy I went over there. It was, uh, it was an, an amazing step up in my life. It forced a lot of discipline, hard work, rigor into me and my love for the forces started in the National Defense Academy entrance exam and I had the option to join the Air Force but I also got through IIT Kharagpur where I had the option to take aerospace engineering so the choice between Air Force, Kharagwasa, India and aerospace engineering, Kharagpur, IIT, everyone advised me you go to IIT. So I went to IIT and uh, spent a couple of years over there, eventually graduated with the gold medal for the best outgoing student and I took a corporate job and the corporate job was ITC Limited which was at that time the best company which had come for placement and over the next two three years I worked as a factory engineer and I was making cigarettes. So it was a tobacco manufacturing unit and after some time I realized like, what the hell am I doing? I'm doing a corporate job and I said I'm going to go back to the things which have inspired me which I really love and those things were aviation forces and when I was in IIT I was heavily into engineering which is obvious it was an engineering college and uh, we were dealing very heavily with the artistic side as well so the money which I was saying for my MBA education I instead went and literally blew it up in the air by joining a flying club and I got my private pilot license. Now after uh, getting my license I went back to the forces and I started pitching ideas. I still had my day job by the way so all of those who wanted to jump into entrepreneurship I would say test your ideas don't just leave your day job. Uh, I retained my day job and I started pitching ideas and some of those ideas were accepted that's when I quit my job my ITC tobacco manufacturing so I was a cigarette salesman who became a computer game developer and is now uh, doing AR and VR particularly applying to the original loves of my life which is for the forces and into aviation and uh, it's been a good journey so far and I really look forward to share what has been the outcome of this journey with you. So some of it is going to be what we have done, some of it is in terms of what we believe we will be doing. And uh, this is an extension of the talk which happened yesterday at Unite where we talked about how we used a drone op to capture a terrain in very high fidelity and use it for VR simulation. Over here we will simply talk about so many other use cases from there. Now collectively as a company we have been deeply engaged with aerospace and defense so we made the official gaming app of the Indian Air Force which subsequently went down to had 3 million downloads and is being used by Air Force as a perception management tool to teach civilians about what it might be to step into the boots of a fighter pilot and live the day to day experience. From there itself we slowly and slowly expanded from gaming uh, to actual simulation over here we have a MiG-29 being simulated. From there we went into ground crewmen uh, training and similar works for army which includes uh, simulation for the special forces for storming a hijacked airplane and neutralizing the terrorists based upon real use cases and also a bit into robotics. For us gaming is an integral tool and think of it like this that any game engine is a tool, a means to an end. Don't just pick up a tool because you like the tool. You have to be clear in terms of what you want to use the tool for. So if you want to write a novel, you will learn typing. But don't just learn typing and then expect it that you will become a novelist. So realize what is the end which is inspiring you and in this particular case we heavily wanted to use interactive tech irrespective of whether it was gaming, VR, AR, simulation. We essentially call it interactive tech. Yes, but there have been so many other use cases which we didn't cover yesterday which I'm going to cover today. Most notably 
using a game engine which right now I equated to equivalent of typing but expanding it to solve many other problems those which involves computer vision and intruder detection something which the defense forces needed parametric security flying simulators example MiG-29 and all of these cases I will cover now maintenance simulators on a Dornier aircraft uh, IAVO which is a tool which we are making which stands for interact converted into a tool so that we don't have to start from scratch again and again and we can push specific content for this particular application and hence accelerate the overall deployment for energy which is national security guard we have done an anti-hijack uh, proof of concept and finally hardware design which includes goggles so it's not google it's actually supposed to be goggles sorry for the typo this drone op where we assembled a couple of drones and flew them around to capture a very high fidelity terrain data and use that terrain for vr simulation is something which we covered yesterday and today let's move on computer vision and intruder detection so over here this is a product which is called iwts which means indoor war weapons training simulator and this picture is the IWTS being used by BSF so this is a product which has been developed by let's say an Indian Army unit right here based in Hyderabad it's called SDD simulated development division along with a couple of other vendors and is already being deployed where you have virtual targets or virtual range being projected and various army men are practicing using real weapons which have been mounted with a laser sight and wherever they point they shoot the scoring system registers a hit. So there is a projection, there is a projection, and then there is a, uh, a laser finder which is allocating each and every unique ID to the gun sight and awarding them. So this was something which was a very interesting game. The BSF said, suppose we're at the border, and while these, well, this is CGI, computer generated imagery, suppose we take our camera across the border and we load fresh video footage. So for example, we know that there is a particular Jeep which comes and goes from point A to point B and we know that it is being used to ferry a material which we do not want to be crossed and we want to engage it. But before that we want to practice it. So what or how do we do, how do we do this? How do we go record a video and load into this? So rather than having these static images, if we are able to run a video on the projector and we want our soldiers to shoot it, how do we do that? Which essentially meant it comp dynamic. Number one, it was a relevant use case. They genuinely wanted it. Second thing is, if you are doing a CGI, you know where the target is because the target is being programmed to move that way. So your laser pointer, if it tells you on a two-dimensional area that it is at pixel number 146 by 28, you simply need to know that is where the laser pointer was when the men press the trigger. Was my target also there? Do I give him a hit or not? Now suppose you simply enter the video and you have this jeep which is moving. The computer has no way. So that is where elements like computer vision come in where there is an instructor before he loads the video he identifies an outline of a target and subsequent frame after frame after frame the computer can automatically track that target and hence have generate its own colliders over the video which then can be used for a hit detection. So these are very specific use cases where a normal simulator had to be expanded with big use cases. Now let's extend it slightly. Uh, we had to use computer vision, we had to use paint to be. While we were already working on computer vision, we were also asked to do a proof of concept where the eye soldiers, either because they're exposed, they're vulnerable, or even if they're there, it becomes very fatigued. So is there a way a computer can scan an area and see if there are any humans? A boundary to do computer vision. So the complete pipeline was we deployed a standard analog camera. We mated it up with an analog to digital uh, converter. We added an antenna and this antenna would broadcast it and it would be received in a remote location. Interestingly, far away is a convoy. Once again being fed in, into a computer where interestingly we had a Unity app which was reading this as a webcam texture. 
uh, all of those who are developers may know that if you want to do AR applications in Unity 3D, then you have to read via a USB. And over here, we were simply broadcasting it, receiving it, and then doing the video analytics on top. And I'll show a demo of this application right now. So we used a camera, a broadcaster, a reception where you could remotely view it, and we were position in harsh terrain, uh, how, how harsh it was, you could uh, estimate it by that huge snake skin which is lying just behind us, so it was a bit of a jungle related area, uh, we were given a couple of batteries with which we hooked up our system, deployed it, and then, which essentially means surveillance via computer vision, I shall launch it, it's got a couple of modes, one of those modes is, is going to be look for entire bodies, I'll just quickly do a face track. And this is running inside Unity 3D. Uh, you can pretty much understand the interface and over here it is taking a look at me, is looking for a face. And every element which you're right now hearing about AR core or Google coming or Apple coming across with the 3D scanning cameras, at the back end essentially they're computer vision applications and Thanks to them, now you have ready SDKs. You don't need to hard code all this architecture right across into your applications, and they're readily doing this across. For you. Just a word of caution, what they're providing is hard lock to work only on mobile cameras, and if you want to work on something like a simulator or two, but for a huge quadrant which is based all over the country, you do not have simulators in as many numbers. So if you're a pilot and you want to take a particular sortie or if you want to engage a one versus one you don't have to necessarily always go to the simulator can you bring the simulator to you for this we started developing a family of product we call it port flight which means portable flight simulation it's got a VR mode and we try to cater for as many variations what we mean by variations are different configurations of the airplanes which I shall show uh, the data access engages you you have to develop a competent product for which you may never get the data and it's very difficult to get actual references which then you try to arrange via various sources loading realistic terrains having very accurate physics in a game engine you can either use totally digital cockpit no analog so you abstractions which then interlink with the video demonstration of what it might be to fly something like this you just quickly run through it yourselves to the risk of injury or death. This could also become extremely hands-on. In this particular case, our developer, where he is responsible for check of multiple instruments, and in order to simulate his hands, we'll simply use a leap motion, strap down interface with the various multifunctional displays, which by themselves are nothing but touch interfaces. So he pops up, we move on as an example, and we'll take a look at a complete Dornier simulator, which is of what the forces have is move on to the future soldier. For example, in this particular case, we have the future soldier concept, which the commandos themselves want to upgrade to, which means, amongst other things, they'll have variables, and these variables will give them dynamic, real-time information of what to expect and also communicate back their important information like where they are, what are their vitals, are they hit, are they stable, uh, what's the blood pressure, what's the heartbeat, etc. Similarly, over here we have what is called as a problem definition statement from the Indian Army by the Army Design Bureau. Uh, which is talking about that in order to create enhanced situational awareness for the soldier, that they're themselves looking for wearables. Wearables, augmented reality, now none of the information that I'm sharing over here is confidential in any manner. All of the information is either available on the website or is published by the army or the defense forces in association with industry bodies like CII, so this information is in the public domain and frankly these problem statements are out there and if you feel you want to take a shot at it, please definitely try and such technological uh, innovations are not only needed but they are being actively incentivized as part of the overall indigenization, making India program, etc. So please feel free to take a shot at it. We are also taking a shot at it. And we tried with our own variable systems where 
some of the examples what I talked about computer vision, augmented reality all encapsulated in a wearable system which could be further miniaturized so in this piece of a generation 1 Google Glass equivalent close eye display which is connected to and the battery is outside, a battery is dangerous, can explode so it's outside the helmet and the PC is inside and this are this is an example of our early explorations in terms of taking VR as a training tool into operations via augmented reality where real-time information which could be captured with the help of a drone or through some remote surveillance camera is being projected via radio and being projected to the soldiers through AR. And we have been given access to the actual helmets and the real gear which is used by the defense forces and we are trying to make our experiments and POCs and looking to fine tune it. From here uh, we will go into a concept art of where we envisage these systems are going to be used from training in VR to operational use via augmented reality. So here is an example of a wearable uh, with uh, an IP, uh, processing unit, earphones, mic, close eye displays and cameras with which a set of soldiers they gather together and the squad leader in a shared augmented reality session is able to project a map where there is nothing over there but when a soldier sees it through his eyewear he's able to see a detailed map where they design their route and as they follow that route the soldiers are able to say the friendlies and the virtual marker in terms of the rendezvous point or the RP where they're supposed to head one of the soldiers lets go of a drone and the aerial imagery of the drone is again easily accessible and all of these use cases in bits and pieces is something which you demonstrated yesterday in the form of a drone op or in the form of variable systems which are currently under utilization you're able to geotag a particular piece saying over here we have a threat and those people who are wearing glasses as they're walking around on the ground when they go to that exact area they'll see the geotags so you can geotag areas you can geotag targets a person could be assigned a target I want you to cover this window and the other people can see whether the window is covered or not you could say what kind of threat is being perceived and a soldier is covering that if you see friendlies then via computer vision you could also identify non combatants at the same time this imagery is being broadcasted in real time to the people who back in the headquarters who are running the mission who are seeing all this on a digital sign table where they're also getting enhanced situation awareness and are then advising the people so imagine that information like this was available before the commandos went into an area like Taj Hotel on 2611 where when these people went they had no clue while the terrorists had been there for almost more than a day and hence had hardened their shelters in hence an upper hand and it became very difficult for these people to storm them out with this with their augmented reality displays they could see a map projection of where they're supposed to enter what is the path projected plan their route, geotag, actual information of where are the threat areas, what are the clear areas and then step in with a much higher chance for victory. And with that I bring this presentation to a close. So thank you very much for being such patience. Thank you so much and I will be extremely happy to take as many questions you can throw at us. So I'll pass the mic around and I have a, a mic for me. Over. Introduction, I'm a chemical engineer from IIT Kharagpur itself, so mm -hmm. nice meeting you again. Uh, I have reservations about the term simulations and I want to know about the technology e except for the Unity 3D for uh, uh, that you employ when you're uh, 
uh, calculating and simulating the MiG-29 project that you did in air and uh, calculating the interplay of the two, the four forces you said, the thrust, gravity, and the lift and uh, the air drag. So that is the first question. And uh, is there any other software that you use to employ and simulate them correctly? Because as much as I have experience with Unity physics, it's not really up to the standard. Okay, Unity 3D is a good game engine in the sense of it gives you a good base hard architecture. What I, what I mean by a hard architecture is if you're developing anything from scratch, then even the basics, for example, how do you get a basic game loop? How do you get your while one cycle going on? How do you get a rendering? How do you, when do you talk to the CPU? When do you talk to the GPU? And your interface with basic elements like the memory, the input system, etc., is something which Unity takes care of. So just call that as a good hard platform or architecture design. On top of that, you have to develop your own soft architecture heavily. So while Unity Physics itself is not simulation uses, they typically use an external package and they create sockets. So in the case of Tejas, for example, they say that we want you to create a CGI module, which is computer generated imagery module. We don't want you to compute. We don't want you to calculate the quaternions or the transforms. You let that be handled by an external program, which could be for all you know MATLAB. It is doing the calculation and hence passing you the cell. The moment you fly out of a uh, 100 kilometer range, then your precision is left only on the last digit, which means items start fighting in terms of Z depth buffer. The, the, the computer doesn't know uh, where we have been bending it out of its will to do it tasks which it was not meant to do. But it's a good start. Yeah. And uh, one more question. I just checked expenditure, and that's roughly 2.5% of the GDP. And I want to know what is the scenario of the different startups in India and how much of that expenditure is actually going into our own domestic, domestic startups? Uh, this is a very opaque number. We ourselves do not have access to it. And plus, this is a number which... Uh, I can't answer authoritatively. The scenario is better than what it used to be, but it's still not there where we would want it to be. An ideal scenario would be when they graduate, they already have military experience, they're able to create startups where they understand the use cases. Over here, we, while we have some domain expertise, we still have to develop something with certain assumptions, go, present it over there, and iterate it. So. It is a path which is not as streamlined. In the end, it is a very procurement driven industry. Sorry. And hence, this path is only for those who are really passionate about it. And we hope that in the days to come, this is further streamlined. Till now, most of the Make in India program or the indigenization program is mostly meant for technology import and make parts of it. He needs to find an Indian vendor who can support him. That is going to be a tier two vendor. That is somewhere where these companies, they are not necessarily going to take a startup, but they will have someone who has the capital and the resources, someone like a Tata. So startups typically will be a tier three or tier four vendors. In my opinion, the forecast at least is good. Because then if you have a startup, if you're able to validate your idea, find a genuine use case, and I said the army use cases are there in the public domain, you can search for that document, the CII army statement, and if you can build a solution, propose it. It could be tested, evaluated, and if you could tomorrow scale it, it's a good target for an acquisition by a bigger party like a tier two vendor.